Good morning. In today's presentation, I would like to have you use your imaginations. I would like to take you back in history 2,000 years. And I would like you to ask yourself, if you had met Jesus 2,000 years ago, do you think that you would have recognized him as the Messiah? And most Christians today like to think that they would have, but how realistic is this? How realistic do you really think this is? What would it have taken to recognize Jesus back then? What sort of things would those people have been looking for? Now to get a better understanding of this matter, try to imagine that you were there that day when Jesus first announced publicly that he was the Messiah. Now this great announcement was made in the same small synagogue that Jesus had attended year after year as he was growing up as a child in Nazareth. Jesus had come home to make this announcement. He knew these people. They were his friends. And this is what happened. Quote, as he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unquote. Now, Jesus read a passage where Isaiah foretold the coming of the Anointed One, a term which is translated from the original Hebrew word Mashiach, or Messiah. And it is also translated from the original Greek word Christ. The word Christ means the same thing as Messiah, the Anointed One. Now as Jesus sat down, he turned to speak to the assembled crowd. To continue the quote, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he said to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Unquote. Jesus, for the first time in public, had announced that he was the Messiah. Now imagine the thrill, the wonder, and the privilege to even be there at this time and to witness the stupendous proclamation. How do these people respond? How do the people of his own village respond? Were there tears of joy? Were there songs of thanksgiving? Did the skeptics in the audience gather around so he could explain the details of his claim to them? The answer is no. None of these things happened. Instead, quote, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. This story is found in Luke 4. Now consider, these people have been prayerfully yearning for the coming of the Messiah for hundreds of years. And yet, when he finally did come, they immediately sought to destroy him. Now, what could have been the reason for this violent reaction? Why would Jesus' friends have treated him like this? Now, Jesus quoted another passage, also found in the book of Isaiah, to explain his friend's su surprising response to his announcement. Jesus said, quote, This people draweth nigh unto me, the Messiah, with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. That's from Matthew 15. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Now there are literally dozens of instances in the Bible where the cause of God is referred to as a highway, a way, a road, or a path. And here Jesus was saying that the Jews had been led off of God's true path and into the ditch. Furthermore, he tells us, tells us that these people have become blind. If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. 
Now, obviously, these people were not physically blind. So we probably can, be, can safely conclude that Jesus was not speaking here of literal blindness or of a literal road or a literal ditch. Instead, he clearly was speaking of spiritual conditions. He was telling us that the clear insight of these people had become blindness and that these blind leaders of the blind had led their followers into the ditch of misunderstanding, denial, and misinterpretation. Because of their rejection of him as the Messiah, Jesus declared, declared that the faith of these people, which originally was true, now, quote, was in vain. Their faith, because of their misunderstandings and their misinterpretation, now was in vain. Now Jesus truly was the Messiah. The Messiah had come, but the people who had been waiting for him couldn't recognize this fact. They were caught looking for the wrong things. They had become spiritually blind and they missed him. Now, if you actually could have been there 2,000 years ago, and if you could have spoken to a Jewish person, or if you could have spoken to a Jewish rabbi, how do you think that he would have answered if you had told him that Jesus was the Messiah? Fortunately, it is possible to know. There is a book which is almost 2,000 years old which allows us to see how a first century rabbi would have replied to the claim that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, Justin Martyr was a prominent Christian who lived approximately 100 years after Jesus' time. He is described, Justin Martyr is described in Erdman's Handbook to the History of Christianity as, quote, the most notable of the second century Christian apologists. Now, Justin wrote a book titled, The Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. This book is a record of a debate between Justin and Trifo, a Jewish rabbi. And this book offers us some unique insights into the Jewish mind at a time when Christianity was neither well established nor popular. In fact, both the Jews and the Romans at that time considered Christianity to be a detestable little Judean cult. Now, Justin and Trifle's conversation begins when Justin first tells the rabbi that he believes that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. Now, the following excerpt from this book contains the very first argument that this rabbi produced to refute Justin's claim that Jesus was the Christ. Quote, it reads, When I, Justin, had said this, the students who were, who were with the rabbi laughed. But he, smiling, says, I approve of your other remarks and admire the eagerness with which you study divine things, but it were better for you to abide in the philosophy of Plato. Um, as a footnote, Justin, before he became a Christian, had formerly belonged to the Platonic school of thought, and he still wore the characteristic flowing robes of, of a philosopher. To continue the quote, um, quote, it were better for you to abide in the philosophy of Plato, rather than be deceived by false words and follow the opinions of people of no reputation. For when you have forsaken God and repose confidence in man, what safety still awaits you? Now pay attention now. Here's the important part. Quote, But Christ, if he has indeed been born and exists anywhere, has no power until Elijah comes to anoint him and make him manifest to all. And you, having accepted a groundless report, invent a Christ for yourselves, and for his sake are inconsiderately perishing. This story is found in a book titled The Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, page 198. 
The word anti-Nicene refers to the fathers who wrote before the Council of Nicaea. This story can also be found in the 17th chapter of Matthew and I believe in the 9th chapter of Mark. Now let's, let's look more closely at what the rabbi said here. The rabbi Trifo argued that Jesus could not possibly have been the Messiah because as far as he was concerned, anyone who claimed to be the Christ before Elijah had visibly returned from heaven would have to be a false prophet. Now, why would Trifo have said these things? Where did he get these ideas? If we go back to the Old Testament text, we can read that about 850 years before Christ appeared, Elijah the prophet had ascended, quote, into heaven. Into heaven. This is in 2 Kings 2, where it says that Elijah ascended into heaven. Then, about 400 years later, and this would have been about 450 B.C., the Hebrew prophet Malachi appeared, and in his book, Malachi promised that Elijah was going to return to herald the coming of the Christ. Malachi's prophecy reads, quote, Try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. Shall I not open for you the floodgates of heaven to pour down a blessing upon you without measure? Lo, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the day of the Lord comes, the great and terrible day. This is found in Malachi 3.10, and I'm reading here from the Catholic Douay Bible. This was it. This was the primary reason why the Jewish rabbis and their followers had rejected Jesus as the Messiah. As far as they could see, Elijah had not yet physically returned from heaven, so as far as they were concerned, anyone who claimed to be, to be the Messiah had to be mistaken. Now what sort of other things were the Jews expecting to see in a Messiah? Every year at Christmas time, Christians still read the prophecies which foretold the coming of the Christ, the Anointed One. For example, there's the passage from the book of Isaiah which reads, quote, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is found in Isaiah 7.14. So apparently, if this is an indication of what they were expecting, the Messiah's name will be Emmanuel. Now the prophecy continues, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called, among other things, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it, it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. This is Isaiah 9, 6. Now clearly we can see from these passages that the Messiah will be named Emmanuel. He will establish a government. He will sit, quote, upon the throne of David, and he will usher in an era of peace which will see no end. Now there are many other prophecies from the Old Testament which also clearly support these expectations. For example, one of the other Christmas favorites reads, quote, But thou Bethlehem, out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. It's found in Micah 5.2. Clearly, the Messiah will be ruler in Israel. Now Isaiah, going back to Isaiah, he similarly predicts, quote, The Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. It's Isaiah 33. In Numbers 24, 17, it says, quote, A scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the sons of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. 
and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. Again, in Psalms 110.1, it says, quote, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. These are just some of the prophecies that the Jews were waiting to be fulfilled when the Messiah appeared. According to these prophecies, the Messiah will destroy his enemies. He shall have dominion over them, and he shall make his enemies a footstool for his feet. Now this promise, again, is repeated in Jeremiah 23, 5. Quote, Behold, the days come, saith God, when I shall raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Isaiah similarly promises that under the Messiah's leadership, quote, he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not look, lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Neither shall they learn war any more. Isaiah 2. Now can you begin to see the kingly theme that connects these prophecies? Now the Jewish people of Jesus' day were certainly well aware of these prophecies. They knew that when the Messiah finally did appear, he was going to be ruler in Israel. They knew that he was going to reign and prosper as king, and that he was going to sit upon the throne of David. They knew that under his leadership, Israel shall do valiantly, and that he was going to smite and destroy his enemies. They knew that their Messiah would have dominion over nations, that he will possess them, and that he will make them a footstool for his feet. Apparently, they also believed that these passages referred to the destruction of Rome. Finally, and probably most importantly, they knew that after Israel's enemies had all been destroyed, their Messiah would then usher in an era of peace which would see no end and war would cease, quote, even forever. War would cease even forever. These were some of the prophecies that, that the Jewish people were looking to be fulfilled. And why wouldn't they? The Jewish people knew their history. And they knew that in the past, whenever Israel had been conquered by a foreign nation, God had always sent a savior to rescue them. Moses had led them out of slavery in Egypt. Nehemiah and Ezra had delivered them from bondage in Babylon. And the Maccabees had freed them from Syrian oppression. Now back in Jesus' day, the, Jews, the Jewish people once again were a conquered people. This time, they found themselves crushed in the iron fist of the Romans. And once again, the common Jewish people found themselves caught in the middle. On the one hand, they were obliged to dutifully pay the Jewish temple tithes. And on the other hand, they were being bled dry by Roman taxes. Now it was in these times of spiritual anguish that the common Jewish people turned to the Messianic prophecies for hope and consolation. They knew that their Messiah would come and save them. Now considering the past history of the Jews, and considering the explicit promises given in, the, in their prophecies, it's entirely understandable why the Jewish people back then would have been looking for another kingly military leader to appear who was both going to free them from Roman domination and then he was going to restore prosperity in Israel. 
and they knew that the one specific sign that would herald the beginning of this glorious new era was the return of Elijah from heaven. This was their greatest hope, and this is what they were prayerfully yearning to see. Now ask yourself this question. If you had met Jesus 2,000 years ago, do you seriously think that you would have recognized him as the Messiah from the description given in these prophecies? How could you? None of these prophecies have been fulfilled. In fact, when these prophecies are viewed literally, it's actually easier to prove that Jesus could not have been the Messiah than it is to show that he was. Obviously, recognizing Jesus as the Messiah was considerably more difficult than most Christians today seem to realize. Now remember that Jesus had told us that the Jewish religious leaders had become blind. He also said that they had been led off of the true path of God and that they had, been, that they had fallen into the ditch of error and misinterpretation. Now, if Jesus truly was the Messiah, then this would mean that the Jewish religious leaders had misinterpreted what their prophecies were actually saying. Once again, ask yourself, in what way could these prophecies have been viewed differently? What does it really take to understand Bible prophecy. Now Jesus knew what these prophecies said. And if you look at his statements recorded in the Gospels, we can see that he clearly explained how they had been fulfilled. In the Gospel of Matthew, we can read that like in the story of Trypho and Justin Martyr, their conversation. In the Gospel of Matthew, we can read that the other Jewish religious leaders also had asked Jesus' disciples how he could possibly, possibly have been the Messiah when Elijah clearly had not yet returned from heaven. Now apparently the disciples could not answer the rabbi's questions. So they went to Jesus and they asked, quote, Why do the Jewish leaders insist Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Unquote. Now Jesus answered that this question was valid and that this prophecy was true. He said, quote, They are right. Elijah must come and set everything in order. And then he made the startling announcement. Quote, in fact, he, Elijah, already has come, but he wasn't recognized and was badly mistreated by many. Then the disciples realized he was speaking of John the Baptist. Now, this story can be found in Matthew 17, uh, verses 10 to 13. And it can also be seen in Mark 9, verses 11 to 13. Now, according to Jesus, this prophecy had already been fulfilled. Elijah had already returned, quote, from heaven, but, quote, he wasn't recognized. Jesus explained that John the Baptist was the return of Elijah. Now, how could this be possible? How could John have been Elijah? John was born 850 years after Elijah. He had a different mother, a different body, a different name, a different personality. He had different teachings, and he had a different purpose. Now, even John himself said that he was different. At one point, early in his ministry, John the Baptist was asked whether he was Elijah. He answered that he was not. This is in John 1.21. Jesus, however, said that he was. Now this apparent contradiction can be resolved by a statement made at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, where it explains that John went, quote, on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. 
That's in Luke 117. Elijah had returned in spirit and in power, not in flesh. Now, going back to the expectation of the Jewish people, the Jews of Jesus' day sincerely believed that Elijah was going to physically descend from heaven. However, according to Jesus, they were wrong. They had been led astray. The actual fulfillment of this prophecy was much different than what they had been led to expect. Elijah had returned, but not physically. Instead, it was, quote, in the spirit and power of Elijah. This is what had returned, and not Elijah's fleshly body. Now, we as Baha'is know that the writings of the Baha'i faith offer some unique insights into these kind of questions which have puzzled Christians for centuries. For example, regarding this matter of the return of Elijah as John the Baptist, the Baha'i writings tell us, quote, a return is indeed referred to in the Holy Scriptures, but by this is meant the return of the qualities, conditions, effects, perfections, and inner realities of the lights, which recur in every dispensation. The reference is not to specific individual souls and identities. This quote is from Selections from the Writings of Abdu'l-Baha, page 183. In other words, it was not this, it was the spirit and power of Elijah which had returned, and not Elijah's specific individual physical body. Now, how else were the rabbis expecting Elijah to return? We can see from these Bible accounts that the Jewish religious leaders had rejected Jesus' explanation that Elijah had returned spiritually in John the Baptist. Now, if the rabbis couldn't accept Jesus' interpretation of this prophecy, then what sort of things were they expecting to see when Elijah returned? Now, the rabbis knew from the Old Testament account that, quote, a chariot of fire, unquote, had carried Elijah, quote, into heaven, unquote. And it's possible that they might have been expecting him to return in this exact same way. Now, to them, any suggestion that they could possibly miss Elijah's return was almost unthinkable. After all, how could they possibly miss anything as spectacular as a prophet of God floating down from out of the sky in a chariot of fire? Now, in addition, what other things could they have been expecting? Would they have been expecting the angel Gabriel to come and blow his trumpet to announce Elijah's appearance? Would they have been expecting beams of light to come streaming down from heaven? Would they have been expecting angels to appear rank upon rank, singing and playing their harps? And what would Elijah look like? Would he be tall, dignified, and ruggedly handsome? Would he come dressed like the temple priests in their spotlessly clean ceremonial robes? Would he have a halo around his head? Now, if these things were anything like what the Jews were expecting, then that's certainly not what they actually got. John the Baptist didn't come sailing down from heaven in a chariot of fire. Instead, he came from out of the desert. He didn't have a halo, and there weren't any angels, harps, or light shows to announce his appearance. Instead of the dignified, spotless robes of a high priest, this dirty-looking fellow wore a leather loincloth, a camel's hair robe, and he ate locusts for lunch. John actually ate grasshoppers. Needless to say, John the Baptist did not fit any picture that these rabbis had of what the spectacular second coming of Elijah was going to be like. 
But that's not even the worst of it. What really turned these Jewish experts, religious experts and scholars, these Jewish dignitaries, away from John the Baptist was the contemptuous way that he had treated them. Now remember that these priests and rabbis considered themselves to be very holy men. They were the elect, the best and the brightest that Judaism had to offer. And they had tremendous responsibilities. It was their job to safeguard and to protect the ceremonial purity and the doctrinal orthodoxy of their beloved religion. Now they too were the ones who performed the rituals inside the temple of God. And they were the ones who conducted the all-important animal sacrifices which atoned for the sins of a common people. And maybe most importantly in this context, these rabbis were the ones who would announce when Elijah had returned. And they were the ones who would announce when the Messiah had come. Now as far as the uneducated average Jewish person in the street was concerned, whatever these priests, scribes, or rabbis decreed was the truth, and it had to be obeyed. This was the power that the Jewish priests had over their people. Now from the priest's perspective, the priest knew that they had performed their duties exactly as prescribed in the Law of Moses. So it wouldn't be too surprising if they also would have been expecting some kind of reward for a job well done when Elijah finally did return. At the very least, they probably would have expected to be re rewarded with some kind of place of honor in the soon-to-appear Messianic Kingdom. Now, instead of congratulations and kind words, however, John the Baptist commanded them to repent and to change their misguided ways. Now, you can probably very easily imagine the outrage and the indignation that the priests must have felt when John likened them to the snake who in the Jewish creation story caused the fall of humanity. John called them a, quote, generation of vipers, a generation of snakes. This is in Matthew 3, uh, 7, verse 7. Needless to say, there was no way that these religious experts could ever believe Jesus' explanation that John the Baptist was the long-awaited return of Elijah from heaven. As far as they could see, none of the prophecies had been fulfilled. Elijah had not yet returned from heaven, and the King Messiah, the one who would destroy his enemies, had not yet come. As far as they could see, nothing had changed. Everything was just as it always had been. Now, there was only one problem with their conclusions. These so-called Jewish religious experts were dead wrong. Now, the mistakes that these rabbis made so many years ago have had a lasting impact upon Judaism. Today, the Jewish people still await the return of Elijah. Every year at the Passover feast, the celebration, Jewish mothers in a time-honored tradition still set an extra place at the dinner table, hoping that this will be the year when Elijah finally does return to join them. Now ask yourself, have we learned anything from these mistakes of the past? Christians today shake their heads in amazement and wonder how those people, those people back then 2,000 years ago, how they could have been so blind. But be honest, if you had been there 2,000 years ago, would you have interpreted these prophecies any differently? There is a modern proverb which says that those who don't learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. Ask yourself, have we learned anything from these mistakes of the past? Or are we repeating the same mistakes right now? We know that the Jewish people of 2,000 years ago were expecting the literal, physical return of Elijah from heaven. We also know 
that Jesus said that this prophecy had been unexpectedly fulfilled and that Elijah had already returned spiritually in John the Baptist. The same is also true of the other messianic prophecies which have been quoted. According to the explicit text of the prophecies, the Messiah was supposed to be a king. Now, Jesus was a king, but his kingdom was not of this world. His was a spiritual kingdom. The Messiah was also supposed to be named Emmanuel. But Jesus was not named Emmanuel. However, he was the embodiment of the inner meaning of this name, which means God with us. That's in Matthew 1.23. Again, the Messiah was also supposed to make his enemies a footstool for his feet, and he was supposed to smite and destroy rival nations. Now, Jesus did not literally subdue any nations. However, he has conquered the hearts of millions of people worldwide. Can you begin to see how these messianic prophecies were fulfilled in the past? And can you see that they were all fulfilled in non-literal symbolic ways? Now, if the people of Jesus' day were expecting the literal fulfillment of their prophecies, and if they were dead wrong, then what about the Christians today who likewise expect the literal fulfillment of their prophecies? Are they wrong too? If the prophecies were fulfilled spiritually in the past, then why would anyone believe that they would be fulfilled literally today? Is God consistent? Of course he is. If it was actually possible for the Jews, for God's own chosen people, to have become totally misled in the past, and apparently without their even rec being able to recognize it, then what are the chances that the exact same thing also has happened to God's other chosen people, to the Christians of today? Now most Christians today don't seriously believe that they could ever have become misled. But then again, that's exactly what the Jews of 2,000 years ago thought. Have modern Christians become deceived? Have they too fallen into the ditch? What did Jesus and his apostles have to say about this? Jesus clearly warned that false Christs and false prophets will appear and shall perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, the electos in Greek, the chosen. This is in Matthew 24, 24. I know some translations say, if possible. If it wasn't possible, why would he give the warning? Especially since the warning is clearly repeated in other places. According to Jesus, even the elect the saved and the best that Christianity has to offer, Jesus says that even these will be deceived at the time when he returns. This warning is also repeated by the Apostle Peter, who wrote, Israel had false prophets as well as true, and you Christians likewise will have false teachers among you. They will import disastrous heresies. They will gain many adherents to the dissolute practices, through whom the true way will be brought into disrepute. God's curse is on them. They have abandoned the straight road and lost their way. That's in 2 Peter 2.1 in the New English Bible translation. There are many warnings in the New Testament text that Christians in the last days will have become misled, that they too will have misinterpreted their prophecies and their scriptures. This is a very sad thing. And we Baha'is believe that the promise that Jesus was going to return has already been fulfilled. And Baha'is believe that Baha'u'llah is the fulfillment of the Christian prophecies. That once again, God has sent a prophet to humanity, almost within our own time period. And that just as all the other prophets in history, Baha'u'llah has not been a appropriately recognized 
and that, in fact, most Christians today have indeed been found sound asleep, that they have been misled, and that because of this strange sleep and, and blindness, as Jesus put it, they have missed the coming of the Christ. They have missed the return of Christ. And Baha'u'llah very clearly states that he is the promised one whose coming was foretold in the Jewish scriptures. Christians today wonder why the Jews 2,000 years ago couldn't have taken Jesus' claims to be the Messiah a little bit more seriously. It would appear that anyone who makes the claim to be the Messiah should be carefully uh, questioned, researched, uh, that these, this is a claim that should not be taken lightly and that should not easily be rejected. The same thing is true of the claims of Baha'u'llah. And this is what we as Baha'is ask Christians to do. We ask you to examine his claims and to, to judge with an open and unbiased mind whether Baha'u'llah actually is the promised one, the one whose coming was foretold in the New Testament prophecies. This is all the time I have for today. Um, I'm going to be continuing these themes in other presentations. Um, and I invite you to come back because this, if it is true, if Baha'u'llah actually is the promised one, is very possibly the most important event 